to me. Every nation must be saved. I hear God singing to me. Every challenge must be raised. I feel God's spirit in me. Quenching Good morning, friends and family of the Midpoint Ministry. Nancy and I wanted to share a few thoughts this morning that will hopefully help us all to see God at this troubled time in our nation and in this world. Many people don't know what to say or do at this time. There is a lot of hurt and confusion, and people are feeling a lot of things. The media and social media are fueling division in our world. The pandemic, politics, the election, the Supreme Court, racial unrest, Everyday sin, which destroys everything in its path, are all contributing to the unrest we feel all around us. It sometimes seems unbearable. All I can say is Jesus is our only hope at this hour. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
You know, I have to look at Jesus at this time. You know, sin has destroyed and wrecked so many lives since the beginning of time. Jesus is truly our only answer. Mm -hmm. His words and his ways work, though. The world does not have the answers. God's word is our answer, and we must look to him first. What is the guide for your thoughts, feelings, words, and your actions? All of these things have gotten me into trouble at times, my thoughts, feelings, words, and actions. You know, feelings are so powerful and can control our actions. There have been times when my feelings of hurt have caused me to do things that Jesus would not do. At these moments, I felt shame and guilt. And, in, and until I align my feelings and thoughts, words and actions with Christ, I have not felt peace. You know, Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Well, first of all, I just want to say that I really miss all of you and not being together and face to face. And, you know, it will just be so great when we're able to be together again and hug and sing and pray uh, but for now, we're making the best of the situation, and the church has never closed, and we are still loving each other and loving God and striving to honor God mm -hmm. with our lives. Um, secondly, we both just want to reiterate that we hate racism, dissensions, hatred, factions, favoritism, and we're thankful that we are not a segregated church, that we love all of our brothers and sisters from all backgrounds. We're thankful for each person. And we believe it's pleasing to God that we are together and we are unified and we together strive to be a light to all nations and all peoples. And, you know, I personally hate it whenever anyone is hurt. I hate it whenever anyone or whenever Satan is, is trying to divide his church. I, I pray about that so much because it, it just grieves me. It hurts my heart. And um, I pray about that constantly. And I, and I always just try to remember that it is Satan who's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. He is trying to steal, kill, and destroy our peace, our joy, our love, all of the fruits of the Spirit, the, the Spirit that we have living in us, um, He is trying to destroy that, all of those fruits. And we don't want to grieve the Spirit. We don't mm. want to allow Him to do that. Um, we don't want to grieve the Spirit as it says in Galatians 5 in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is not, no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Amen. You know, I know at this hour, there. you know, when I look around, 2020 has been a crazy year. You know, I think with the pandemic, we want to say if you're hurting financially at this moment or you're just fearful of the virus and need someone to talk to, mm -hmm. we want to make sure you're taken care of. So please reach out. Reach out to Nancy and I or one of the house church leaders or one of the shepherding couples or one of the staff members. But please don't sit at home in fear. We want to talk to you and make sure you feel taken care of. Mm -hmm. You know, with the racial unrest, as Nancy mentioned, racism is such an ugly sin. You know, it has affected every society on earth. I've traveled to 20 different countries, and racism exists in all countries. It's just different groups of people. It hurts to see people treated differently because of their ethnicity. Praise God that he created us all equal in his sight. Mm -hmm. I wish I could say that racism is going to be eradicated from the earth, but it is a sin. Mm -hmm. And like all sin, it comes from men's hearts. Mm -hmm. We must look through a spiritual lens and not a sociological lens, or we're going to live in a constant state of unrest. Jesus is the answer for all sin. As Nancy mentioned, Satan has come to steal, kill, and destroy. 
Jesus came to give us life and to the full. And only in Christ can we have a full life in spite of all the sin and craziness that is going on around us. You know, politically, I'm sorry that we are such a divided country. We need each other so much at this time. God will use whatever happens, though, to his glory, and we need to trust that, even though it's very challenging at this time. You know, we've got to put on the full armor of God and fight with the God's weapons, not with the world's we weapons. Satan is going to make sure that the battle keeps raging on. We need to individually and collectively as a church strive for holiness to fight this battle. Yeah. You know, in Hebrews 12, verse 14, it says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Mm. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and, and defile many. Brothers and sisters, we love you. We look forward to a great worship this morning. Let's bow and pray at this moment. Father, we come to you at this hour and our hearts are troubled and yet we feel peace at the same time because we know you are in control, God. That you allow things to go on to, to change us, to transform us, to, to reach people, God. We pray for the pandemic, God. We want it to end, God. We want to see each other. We want to be with each other, God. Our hearts are overwhelmed, God. At moments, we just... We want to hug our friends and family members and people we love so deeply. Please, God, give us a quick healing, a quick vaccine, one that will transform the world, God. But more than that, a spiritual, your spiritual vaccine, God, we pray people would turn to you. Mm -hmm. God, we pray for the politics here in the U.S., God. May we in the church be a light to the world around us. God, we have your answers with your word, but not in politics, God. We pray that we'll just submit to you in everything. God, we thank you for the church. We know we need to continue to grow. We pray for wisdom and guidance and direction. Thank you for every brother and sister, God. We pray for those who are hurting and weak and sick and struggling. God, we pray that we can rejoice with those who are rejoicing. God, thank you so much for this time of worship. We love you. We thank you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> believe it I have the most wonderful news I'm gonna be your teacher for forever <laughs> just joking but today our lesson is about friendship how do we build a friendship with God I've got a few ideas <laughs> entirely the way to build a friendship with God but it was fun and you could do that too you can take the Bible with you wherever you go but you know for those of you who want to know the real nuts and bolts of building a friendship with God I've got a couple of children we're going to talk to after all Jesus said the kingdom belongs to such as these can you be friends with God who you can't see. Well, it needs to be like nice. And mm -hmm. if you did Jesus, even though you can't see God, it still means you're a friend if you believe in him. So, yeah. Thank you. We're learning how to be friends with God. So, tell me, 
What do you do to connect with God? Well, every night I pray because sometimes I get a little bit scared and sometimes when I'm feeling some really strong things, I write or I draw about it and then it helps me calm down a little bit and then I talk to my parents about it. That's wonderful. Yeah, definitely. We all need a friend like that, don't we? That was wonderful. I'm so grateful we got to hear from Leo and Ali about what it means to be a friend with God. You know, Leo said, believe. We've got to believe God is who he says he is. And Ellie said, prayer. Prayer is really just talking to God. So the way we build a friendship with God is believing he's there, spending time reading the Bible and talking to him, which is prayer. I'd love to share a scripture with you that I think really illustrates this point. It's in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Turn all your worries over to him. He cares about you. You can put any word there. Your worries, your happiness, your concerns, your sadness. He wants to hear because he cares. We have a God who loves us first. And the more we go to him, the more we learn about him, the better our friendship will be. Boys and girls, today I'd love you to take a picture, take a video and send it to us so we can see what your friendship with God is like. You can send it to midpoint at chicagochurch.org. That's all for now, children. I can't wait to see you again. Bye. Encourage my soul and let us journey on for the night is dark and I am far from home. Thanks be to God, the morning light of peace. Encourage my soul and let us journey on, for the night is dark and I am far from home. Thanks be to God, the morning light of peace.
Good morning, church. My name is Jeff Floresca, and this is my beautiful wife, Kristen. And this morning, we get to share some thoughts with you to prepare our hearts and minds for communion. We're going to look at verses, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 28. I'll go ahead and read that. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves be before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. So around this time, every Sunday, all of us um, brothers and sisters who have made Jesus our Lord and Savior participate in this event really to commemorate um, God's sacrifice. Jesus' body was broken, Jesus' blood was spilled, and he was crucified in order for all of us to have this opportunity to be reconciled to God. It says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus promised to return, and at this time when we participate in this event, we need to keep that in mind. We need to focus on that. And also it says we need to examine ourselves um, before we eat the bread and drink of the juice. Why, why does God want us to examine ourselves? I think God wants us to look at our hearts, look at our minds, and see that we are still grateful, that we are um, acknowledging you know, what he has done for us. Jesus died for a reason. And it says on John 3, 16, the exact reason why, why Jesus had to die. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Kristen would like a, to share a few more thoughts on that verse. Um, good morning. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share a few things that... I've been thinking about um, in the last couple weeks since really becoming an empty nester, like officially. Um, our kids were both home during COVID for some bonus months, but um, now our son Jacob is back at college and um, we actually, or I actually just helped my daughter Abby move to New Orleans. And I think through this transition time, I'm realizing you know that just feels a lot more permanent um, that she's really moved to another state she's got a job she's going to be um, helping to grow the campus ministry there which are great things and you know we're super excited for her um, but what I've been reflecting on is that I think I'm realizing my identity has been very wrapped up in being a mom and I think I've known that for years now, um, and I knew this day was coming when they were going to leave. But it's still it's still hard when you're actually there. And um, so um, I think one of the things for me it's it's just very tempting to feel insecure, um, to feel anxious sometimes. Um, our son actually got COVID like after the first week of school and even with the hurricanes in New Orleans, I mean there's always something in life that you can feel anxious about. Um, but the insecurity comes in sometimes just not even knowing what should I be doing now? Like what should my focus be and how should I be spending my time? and. Um, so John 3.16 really brings me to understand that God knows exactly what I'm going through. Um, it's kind of weird, but I had the thought, 
last week, I was just thinking, wow, God actually was like an empty nester. <laughs> um, you know, he let Jesus come to the earth and leave his side and live. And, and then I think the hardest part of that is he then allowed him to die a horrible death and had to watch Jesus go through all of that. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that hits me too is that when Jesus was dying on the cross, he actually cried out, why have you forsaken me? Like he did not feel connected to the Father for the first time ever. And, um, you know, I just think about with our kids, how important that is for them to feel connected with us and close to us, even though they're far away. Um, you know, just to be able to talk and, and check in and get encouragement or, you know, whatever. And Jesus felt completely alone at one point. And I honestly can't imagine how painful that was um, and how painful that was for the Father. But they, or he, was willing to do that for us because, mm -hmm. and, and he did it because of our sin. Um, and so instead of when examining myself, I could definitely feel guilty um, when I think about that. But instead, I, I do take comfort in this verse in Hebrews 14, or I'm sorry, 4, verse 14 through 16. And it just talks about how Jesus is a high priest who can really empathize with our weaknesses. Um, it talks about how he was tempted in every single way that we are, but yet he didn't sin. And um, and then the encouraging part is it says because of that, we can then approach God's throne of grace with confidence and find grace and mercy in our time of need. And I, I think I do approach communion in that way. That's kind of how I view it. Um, and it's just encouraging to know that really no matter what we're going through um, or what period in our life, you know, or transition time, God fully understands and can help us with those things. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you so much for loving us the way you do. Thank you so much for your mercy and compassion on us. We are so grateful for your sacrifice. Thank you so much for allowing Jesus to go down and, and be the sacrificial lamb so that we can be reconciled with you. We are so undeserving of your love. Please forgive us of all our sins. Help us at this time to focus on you, to fix our eyes on your sacrifice and see clearly how much you love us and want to have a relationship with all of us. Father, renew our spirit at this time. Awaken us so we can all proclaim Jesus' death, and we pray that he returns very soon. And in his beautiful name, we pray all these things. Amen. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. I hope you've been having a great time of worship so far. I want to thank the Florescas for leading our thoughts in communion. For Miss Alice leading uh, the children in, in their worship moment. And uh, we thank the Dawsons for sharing their hearts and some of their thoughts uh, to welcome us to service today. And uh, we want to take just a, a brief moment to reiterate what they shared. Uh, obviously, 2020 has been challenging in so many different ways uh, to see the, the racial tensions that have just boiled over in our country this year, uh, to, to hear so many of the stories of how uh, disciples um, have been affected by racism, um, how that pain cuts so deep. Um, I mean, it, it hurts our hearts. Uh, we hate racism. We hate the effects it has on people. Uh, and we want the church to be that beacon of hope to the world, uh, th th to let our light shine. We want uh, none of that to creep into, uh, none of the world to creep into the church, but for the church to continue more and more to creep into the world and affect yeah. the world uh, so that God's ways and God's love is felt throughout. Yeah. Uh, and we know with the pandemic, uh, people have been affected in their jobs. They've been affected just in their relationships. Some people are feeling more isolated and they're struggling through that. Uh, uh, again, man, we hurt for you. We want you to know we're here for you uh, in, in whatever ways we can. And, uh, and that we want to be united with one another in a way that, uh, again, can be a light to the world. Um, and so... We just want you to know you guys are continuing continually on our hearts. Yes. And uh, we know that among the, the fellowship, there is such a deep love for one another. And and uh, we know that that's going to continue to grow. Um, but we, we're here for you. We're praying for you. Uh, and, and we're going to get through this. And it's going to be to God's glory, I truly believe, all in the end. Yeah, I know. We've talked to so many of you that are just feeling a lot about what is going on in society, you know, what is going on in our world. And uh, we, it's so hard for us to not be with you, you know, like Nancy said, to be together. And I, I absolutely see Satan at work in so many ways through all of this, you know, trying to, to divide us and pull us apart from each other and um, and, and stirring up all this evil in the world. Um, we want you to know that we're there for you. Even though we can't be physically together sometimes, um, as, as a whole body, I, I pray that the, the spirit within each of us just connects us in this time more powerfully, that we don't want to be like the world. We don't want uh, to, to let even the things of the world come into the church, uh, that we want to remain that beacon of hope and of love um, and, and, and what the church was, was made for, that that is our hearts. Um, we, you know, it just, it pains our hearts so much to, to hear some of the things you guys are going through, to hear some of the things that you guys face daily in the world right now and we want to walk with you we want to be there we want the church to just come arm in arm with each other so please know that we're here um and and i know that's echoed through the rest of the congregation uh, we have a, a few announcements for you um you know as always each week we're just so grateful for all the disciples who are continuing to give sacrificially and generously in the weekly offering uh, again this can be done online uh, through the Chicago Church website. If you have our app, there is a place where you can do it through there. Or if you want, you can actually mail in your offering to the church offices. And I'm sure you're seeing all the info for that up on the screen right now. You know, kind of in line with that, last week's service, uh, we talked about how we're kicking off our special missions offering season, so to speak. Obviously, in the springtime, things got all kinds of crazy with the pandemic breaking out. Uh, but there are still needs all around the world for the gospel to be heard. And uh, it was so great to send out a, a group of young people to revive Eastern Europe. But the Chicago Church is going to be taking up our special missions offering on November 15th. And so I really want you to, if you haven't already, to start having it on your heart and start making preparations uh, to give what you can give in a sacrificial, generous way towards this effort. 
Um, we our, our goal is still to give 10 times our weekly offering. We understand some people, uh, because of the pandemic and perhaps their job situation, they, they might not be able to do that. And to that, we completely understand and say, you know, give what God has put on your heart. And we know for others, uh, you've been able to do all right through this time. And, and financially, you're okay. Maybe you're able to give more. And we would encourage you to do so in that regard. But to kind of help uh, help us understand more of what's going on and hear some news of what's happening over in some of the places that our special missions help support. Uh, we have a short video here from David and Nadia de los Santos, uh, who were baptized here in the Midwest, but now have spent so much of their time as Christians, as missionaries. They just recently landed in Budapest, Hungary to help lead the church there. So let's watch this update from them. Greetings from Eastern Europe. My name's David. Uh, this is my beautiful wife, Nadia de los Santos. This is our lovely newborn three-week-old daughter, Winona. And we just wanted to give a huge thank you for all your support that you give here to Europe. We were converted in the Midwest in the campus ministry, but have been on the mission field um, for over five years now, serving in Asia, South Pacific, and now in Europe. And we just started to serve the congregation in Budapest, Hungary. Even though we're in Ukraine right now, getting um, Winona's documents done, um, it's all still it's all still going really well. Yeah, we're still able to do everything virtually, but we wouldn't be able to do anything that we do if it wasn't for you. Uh, the impact of the Midwest on Eastern Europe is uh, so incredible. Uh, you know, all the churches here. Uh, you know, we receive support from from the missions fund and everything like that, but. I think what's also incredible is all the the relational support we get from 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 all you guys in Chicago, the the, the Versages, the Charles, the Arnesons, Dawson's, Lars, and uh, you know the we know TJ and Leela also uh, from the South Pacific. But you know we we've learned a ton from from all you guys. But the other thing that we get is we just get a ton of love and support from all of you, and um, it's just been amazing to, uh, to to just know that we we have you guys there and to know that we have friends in the Midwest. Yeah, because mission work can definitely be tough, and uh, especially during COVID, it's a really tricky time on how to reach new people. Uh, but but the church and and we've we've all been getting really creative, um, and so there's hikes happening, bike rides, um, and all of these have visitors. And our young professionals are doing virtual Bible talks, and new people are coming out every week. So it's an exciting time to see just how God's working despite. Uh, all these restrictions that are being placed and uh, the harvest is definitely plentiful so please please pray for us please do and, and follow us on instagram and facebook and you know we'd love to just keep you all in the loop on what's going on here and hopefully in the future you can come visit us or take a one-year challenge the workers are a few so we'd love to have you and we love you all so much thank you take care if you want to hear more about uh, special missions, uh, the European Mission Society, which is the, the, the group that we give to that helps support the churches throughout Europe, you can go to their website, which is euromissions.org. Um, and we'll put that in the video description in the post description as well, so in case you didn't write it down in time. Now, this has also been... Um, announced the last two weeks. The Ammons are going to be uh, moving to Milwaukee and transitioning there in preparation to lead the church there. And today is a kind of a bittersweet moment uh, because we're going to hear Kurt Ammons preach. That's the sweet moment. The bitter part of it is this is going to be his last sermon as a member of the Midpoint Ministry Center. <laughs> and so... <laughs> And so we are, uh, we're so excited for the Ammons uh, and the whole Ammons family. We're excited to hear uh, you preach and you share your heart and to inspire us this one last time as a member of the Midpoint, although we know uh, you're just up the road and I'm sure our paths will cross in so many different ways. Uh, but before we get to the sermon, we wanted to share some things uh, that hopefully encourage your hearts, Ammons, uh, as you prepare for this transition. Yeah, I mean, we are just so grateful for you guys and your many, many years, your over mm. two decades years of service just in the Chicago church. Um, while you've been here, you've, you've been a part of almost most of the different ministry centers in the Chicago area, uh, leading in various aspects. Um, and the majority of that 
really leading and uh, paving the way for youth and family mm-hmm. ministry. And um, I, I mean, your heart, your love, your passion for youth and family is so obvious. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, you guys have have just done immeasurable work here. Your impact uh, will be felt for generations to come. You know, when when Clint and I started in the ministry here, we started in youth and family with you guys. Mm-hmm. And um, it was a highlight of our ministry years, um, just planning homecomings and camps and talking through um, just various aspects of, of how to engage the hearts of the youth, how to help just generations of families. And um, we are so grateful for you guys. We're so grateful for our partnership with you. Um, and, you know, we have we have a few different honoring things. Uh, one thing I wanted to show you, this is kind of more from the midpoint. It is um, a gold-plated compass. I don't know if you can see in here, but uh, what's more important is what is engraved in it. Mm -hmm. And so it says, thank you for charting the course, paving the way, and setting the example for faith, love, and hope, especially in the youth and family ministry. Mm -hmm. And we hope that it's just a a small symbol of the way you guys have have been our compass in so Mm -hmm. many ways, that you have... Um, just paved the path um, in faith in love and ministry and and that you're going to continue to do so um, in Milwaukee. And so this is just one one small gift we have for you. We have a few little other things in in the works. Um, And so uh, hopefully all the members that are watching this remember that they need to take a special part in one of your gifts and they can, you know, go back to find the emails to figure out what they need to do for that. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, but we we are excited in, you know, in this next coming weeks to really be able to honor you guys. Uh, we wish that we could all be in person. Uh, but next week, we will have a, a special time to say goodbye to the Ammons. Um, so next Sunday, October 4th. Um, at Wheaton Warrenville South High School from 3 to 5 p.m. We're going to just kind of have a drive through parade and send off um, just in the parking lot. So um, if you, you know, go to Wheaton Warrenville South High School between 3 and 5 p.m., the Ammons and their family will be there. Um, We want to just shower them with cards and love and be able to send them off um, in such a special way and you know, this is kind of our pandemic (laughs) send-off. We wish we could do more, but um, but we're excited for that time. So please mark your calendars next Sunday, 3 to 5 p.m., Wheaton Warrenville South High School um, to to just kind of have a a goodbye send-off for the Ammons. Ammons, we love you guys. We're so grateful for how you've given your hearts and served here. Let's give our hearts now to Kurt as he preaches the sermon for us. Good morning, Midpoint. It's so good to be with you here this morning uh, for my farewell sermon uh, entitled The Celebration at the Finish Line. Uh, I'm currently having my home worked on. Uh, It's it's actually Saturday afternoon right now. Uh, My good buddy Victor's over here helping me with my house. Got people coming to see it in and out. House is is not in good shape right now, but it's getting worked on if people want to see it. one of them days, and I thought to myself, just trust God. And uh, so I got I to gotta put my lesson into practice at this very moment right, during my crazy day. Uh, anyway, the title of the lesson today is The Celebration at the Finish Line. And I just wanted to, first of all, start off and say uh, how grateful we are to have been part of the West Ministry uh, the West region for so many years, and then the Midpoint Ministry uh, for just here the last couple years. We have spent well over uh, two decades uh, growing as Christians and building friendships and watching our kids grow up with uh, other friends, and it's just been such an amazing, amazing time of our life. Most of our Christian life spent right here with you, 
uh, in the West and then the midpoint regions. Uh, I pray that today's lesson is an encouragement for you. It's kind of a big picture lesson that I hope just encourages you uh, to finish the race. Um, you know, the celebration at the finish line is one of the greatest motivators to the race that we have. Uh, I have a lot of racing examples uh, in my life that, uh, you know, from whether they're sprints or longer races that I thought about using, but the best, the best race analogy that I've, I've used before is the Spartan race that uh, Tanner and Nate Thompson and Carlos uh, and I all uh, uh, did together um, about four years ago. And uh, I'll tell you, it was what would happen at the finish line that was the motivator in training for that race. Um, you know, I, 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 didn't, I don't really like to run on a treadmill. I don't really care to do cardiovascular work, uh, burpees. But, you know, that day it would be nine plus miles. It would be 20 plus obstacles. It was uh, over 90 degrees. I knew there would be about 100 burpees involved. And it would be, you know, a good uh, multiple hour race on a hot summer day with a lot of challenges. And I wanted to finish strong. I didn't want to just walk the race and, you know, take six, six seven hours and kind of stroll in with a, a light bead of sweat. <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted to be proud of my effort. I wanted to be proud of what I would put into it. Uh, I wanted my wife, who's my biggest fan and I'm the luckiest man in the world to have uh, Heidi as my wife and as my biggest support. I wanted her to be proud. Uh, I wanted my kids, I wanted Chase and Kaylee and Wade to be, to be proud of their dad. I didn't want to just, you know, walk with a, you know, a fanny pack or a camelback full of water, you know, slurping water and walking. I wanted to, wanted to do well. You know, life is a race. Our life as a Christian is referred to as a race multiple times in scripture. There's a starting point. There's an end point. There's a goal. There are obstacles in this race. Um, there are, there's teamwork involved. There, there are so many twists and turns in life. And it, it's a race. The Bible says it's a race marked out for us. And today I want to talk about three quick things. And the first thing is that we got to take personal responsibility to finish strong. I want to talk about the need for perseverance in this race. And I want to talk about just the need that we have people beside us in the race. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. People are watching us. Angels, spiritual beings, demons. They're watching how we, we run the race of life. They're watching how we do. The Bible says angels are ministering spirits that encourage us and help us during tough times. There's rejoicing on both sides. I think when there's victory in our lives spiritually, there's rejoicing with the angels and there's rejoicing with demons when we deny God and we are unfaithful. There's a great cloud of witnesses. Your life matters significantly. How you live in your race. And the Bible says because of this, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. It should encourage us that the Bible says that sin entangles us easily. Because you're, you're battling with sins of mankind that everyone else is battling with too. And so it's part of the race. It says, let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus who for the joy set before him endured the cross. It was, it was what Jesus looked forward to in his race that kept him going. He knew that he would endure opposition from sinful men, as this passage says. He knew he would endure hardship and insult and persecution. And ultimately, he knew that he would take all of our sins on the cross. Think about that. The sins of mankind would be placed on one man, and he knew that he would do that in his race. He had the greatest obstacle, but he did it because of what would be at the finish line. It says that he, he was able to endure it 
because he knew he would sit down at the right hand of God. It was worth it. And it reminds me of the passage that says that our present sufferings, they're not even comparable to how amazing it will be in heaven. And today as we consider our celebration at the finish line, I pray that we always keep our eye on the prize, that it's being with God in our heavenly home that really matters. The first thing I want to share with you about finishing the race strong is about personal responsibility. I think I've shared a little bit about personal responsibility recently, but I share this not because I'm looking at you guys saying you need to be responsible. Honestly, it's what God's teaching me. God's teaching me this lesson to be responsible for my own thoughts, to be responsible for how I re react, not to be a victim. Not to blame people for my decisions or actions, but I'm responsible and that I can respond in a godly way no matter what happens because God will never let me be tempted beyond what I could bear. So I don't have to have a woe is me pity party. I, I, I should not. I got to take responsibility for my life. And that's why I'm preaching this first point because it means a lot to me in my race, and I've experienced it, and I want to share it with you. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 19, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. And he just keeps talking here in this passage about himself. He says to the Jews, I became like the Jews. To those under the law, I became like those under the law. Uh, so to win as many under the law, those not under the law, I became like that. He says to the weak, I became weak. I've become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. He says, I do all things. He's, what's he doing? He's sharing about his personal fight in this race. It's been tough, but he just lays his life down over and over again because he's, he's in it to win it. He's in it to finish strong. And he, then he takes it to the analogy of the race in verse 24. He says, don't you know in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. And he was a living example of this. He talks about going into strict training. You know, I remember training for my Spartan race, thinking about the finish line. I remember how hard it was to train, but I remember all that training paid off. Then he says, after I've preached to others, I won't be disqualified for the prize. What is Paul showing us here? He knew he had to fight himself. And that even in tough circumstances, they couldn't be excuses for him not to be a great disciple. I think one of the greatest examples of this is over in Acts 16. If you look over at Acts 16, Paul and Silas, they're going out, they're going out to pray. You know, they're just going out to find a place to pray. It's a good thing. But it turns into an incredible challenge. Verse 16, uh, chapter 16, verse 16 says, Once when we were going out to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money, and it goes on in verse 18. It says, She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed. <laughs> what turned out is such a great thing for them to do turned out with Paul being just incredibly annoyed. Does this ever happen to you? Things are going great. And then a curveball. You know, life's full of curveballs. Here's a curveball for Paul. In fact, they go out to pray, and then here's what happens to them. And I won't read it all for time's sake. They get seized. They get dragged. They get attacked. They get stripped, beaten with rods. This is after they've been severely flogged. They were thrown in prison. And a severe flogging means a lot of blood. These guys were beaten down with a severe flogging and thrown in prison. And then right when you think it couldn't get any worse, they're sitting in the cell bleeding, an earthquake. If anybody had a right to just be a victim and be angry at God, it would be Paul right here. They were going out to spend time to pray and they ended up beaten down and thrown in prison 
And then an earthquake comes. And they could have said, "What, God, like, why are you doing all of this? What is wrong with me? You must not love me. You must not want to hear my prayers. You must, you must not, you know, you must not be with us. He didn't respond that way. And I want to ask you a question. When things don't go well for you in life, are you, do you like go right to like, God, you're not with me. God, you don't love me. Because you really shouldn't. Because God is with the, those to God, God is with us. God is with you. He sees your challenges. He sees your trials. He sees your temptations. But God is still with you. In fact, God says, I'm not willing to leave you. What ends up happening here with Paul and Silas is they keep their minds, which will be my next point. And a great thing happens from it. The jailer and his family become Christians. Amazing, amazing story about what happens when we keep our minds and persevere under challenging situations. So first of all, we got to make sure we don't blame other people for why we're not doing well. Just like you, I've been hurt by people. I've hurt people. So things have bothered me and things used to bother me a lot more than what they do now. There's one thing I, I can say I've learned. Don't take things so personal. Keep, stay the course. Don't let anybody else take away my faith, my joy. And that's a hard call sometimes, but even troubles and, and circumstances. Paul was not without challenge. In fact, not just here, but just in his life. Look over in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul is really open about his challenge just being a Christian. Not even with outside people, he had those challenges, but he also had challenges just with himself. Can anybody else relate that they have enough battle just within themselves? Paul here in 2 Corinthians 7 says, or 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, <laughs> he goes, I mean, Paul was powerful. But he had this weakness that just kept humbling him. He goes, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Have you ever felt tormented by something in your life? Constantly nagged by it? Feeling like it's always there? I think a lot of us, if not all of us, we can feel this and we have this. Three times I pleaded with God, take it away. But God says, my grace, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. God doesn't take it away. But God says, His grace is made perfect in weakness. And I want to just share with you a couple definitions of these two words I just found super interesting in the Greek here. The grace. You know, we know that it's unmerited favor, but a little bit of a longer definition says it's especially the, the divine influence on the heart. It's acceptance and benefit. So what God is saying is like, my divine influence on your heart, my acceptance is sufficient. And sufficient would be to be possessed with unfailing strength. God sees our weaknesses. God knows about the things that we dealt with in our livelihood growing up that have still then challenges us today, God sees and goes, I see that in you, but my grace is enough. And sometimes those things just humble us and we keep fighting and we can learn from them. But God's grace is enough even through those things. He goes on and talks about these challenges a little more. He says, Therefore I'll boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. I think it's amazing when people share about their weaknesses. When people don't try to act like they have it all together. I love when people get together and say, oh, you know, here's a challenge that we have, whether it's in their life or in their marriage or with them, themselves personally. And I, man, I appreciate your openness. I love to share my life with people too. Because God can work in that. Can, his power is made perfect in our weakness. He says, that's why he delights in weakness and insults, hardships, and persecutions. 
So he kind of says this, makes this list of things that he, he can be challenged by. Weakness, he says. Are there sins in your life that you just are dogged by? I think I've shared that a little bit ago. These are challenges. Insults. You get made fun of at school or at work. Maybe in your own household. Hardships, he says. Financial hardships. Health hardships. Family conflict. Persecutions. Or just difficulties. Maybe being lonely, feeling not valued. Discouraged by the current situation in our world, whatever it may be. He goes, all of these things are part of the race. But keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And don't let any of these things take you out of the race. Perseverance. We all have to endure and persevere. And perseverance, what I've learned more than anything happens in the mind. It's how do I choose to see things? When challenges arise, do I see it as an opportunity to be godly? An opportunity to, to take on a challenge here and honor God? Or do I just let it knock me out immediately? It's so encouraging and good to see challenges, no matter what they are, that come our way and say, God, I know that this challenge is here. It's real. It's hard whether it's a challenge or a temptation or a difficulty, whatever it is, but to see those things and go, I've got to keep my mind right about this and think and be faithful through this challenge. You know, the Bible talks about our minds, preparing our minds for action, being self-controlled. Romans 12, renew our mind. And making that conscious decision that we'll live our life each day, striving to keep our minds in the right place. Perseverance. Lastly, people. If we're going to celebrate at the end, we need people. People beside us. Running that race four years ago with those guys was so awesome. But my most fond memory of it, and the thing I remember the most about it, was the amazing display of perseverance and brotherhood that took place when Tanner got sick in the middle of the race. We were popping down these little stations. They had these little Gatorade pills, or not pills. <laughs> we were taking pills, little gel things, and, you know, little, you know, I don't know, just little jello type things that were supposed to give you energy and they, you know, we're passing them out and, you know, and Tanner just started looking like just sick and he was losing his energy and his face was getting discolored. And he was just like, guys, I, I'm just feeling horrible, but he was pushing. We were drudging through the stinky mud and he was literally sick and the mud smelled horrible. I can't imagine being sick and out in that sun and in that mud. And it came to a point where he was like, guys, just go. Just, just keep going. I'll catch up. Which shows an amazing heart in Tanner to say, I'll catch up. Just I'll keep going. I'm not quitting. And I want to just share, you know, when the going gets tough, we don't quit as Christians. We keep going. The gospel never, the message, the gospel message never stops. He goes, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going. We're like, no, dude, we will be here with you. We'll wait with you. So he went, went over into the shade. He got really sick. And then shortly after, he's like, okay, let's do this. And we all kind of together said, let's do this together. And we just kept going. And we hit this one obstacle. And it was climbing this rope up like 20 feet. And I just remember Tanner being like, man, I want to do that, but I'm just hurting. And the brothers were like, come on, dude, we, we believe in you, man. You can do it. And he's like, all right, I'm, I'm going for it. And he hit this rope and the determination, I think it was the adrenaline. It was really hard to get up and the determination that dude just fought his way to the top. And I think at that moment, we as, as brothers in this, we all were like fired up because somebody who was in a difficult spot got through, you know, was persevering. And, and the perseverance they, sh they, they Tanner sh showed was like 
filling us up with um, a, a great encouragement. And I remember that more than anything. In our, in our situation as Christians, it's not always when things are going easy that we draw great encouragement from each other. It's when we go through tough times. It's when I see people go through tragic times and I have people in my mind right now who do it heroically, who have faced some of the most tragic and difficult situations and are doing so with faith and have done so with faith. And I want to just say that you, you've taught me more than I could ever explain on watching so many of you go through tough times. And there are a number of you that I can think of right now. And I'm not going to list all you off because I'll probably forget somebody. But I, I can think of a number of families right now who went through such challenging times. But you did so and you persevered and inspired. And you've inspired my, my, me and my family. But if we're going to make it to the end, we've got to have people in our life encouraging us not to stop. You know the scripture in Hebrews. It says... You know, let us encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today. Although we're in this kind of in our own race, like I have to, I had to push myself in that race. No one could carry me through the race. I couldn't have jumped on Tanner's back or Carlos's back. <laughs> Carlos probably would have got me a little farther <laughs> than most people, but uh, I couldn't have jumped on Nate's back. No one could have carried me, but they had to be there for me. And no one can carry you in your race. It's, 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 be, it's, it's up to you to go into strict training and to fight. And it's up to you to persevere. But it's up to us to encourage each other together so that we all finish the race together. Thank you for allowing me to have gotten to this point in my race. Thank you for helping my family to have gotten to this point to my race. I pray that we've helped you get farther in your race. May God bless you. Let us celebrate the finish line together. It's been so good. And the race isn't over yet. It's been so sweet. But we look forward to many, many more memories. God bless you. I love you so much. I'll miss you tremendously. Amen.